All right. So good afternoon, everyone. This is lecture number 33. And today we'll be talking about linear fluids. So till now we have uh, we've talked about stresses and strains. In the last lecture, we talked about uh, constitutive modeling and constitutive equations uh, in general. And then we particularly applied that to linear solids, uh, linear elastic solids. So today we'll be applying the uh, constitutive modeling to linear fluids. And then uh, we'll be deriving the equations of motion. And uh, if we get time, then we'll be applying that to a particular problem of free surface flow, which is quite common when analyzing flows in rivers and oceans. And if we don't get time today, then we'll do the uh, application or the example in the next lecture. So this is going to be uh, the second last or the third last lecture of the course. And uh, then um, from next week, uh, we'll start uh, with revision. So what I'll do is I will teach all the classes that uh, we do not have on uh, on YouTube right now. So everything related to the first chapter, mathematical background, will be taught again online so that you can use that to uh, revise your initial few lectures. So let's start with today's lecture, uh, linear fluids. So um, first, we have to understand what fluids are. So fluids uh, include liquids and gases. So I'm not going into detail of what liquids and gases are, um, but uh, in terms of uh, the exact definition, but I'm sure everybody has a feel of what is a liquid and what is a gas. Now, uh, how, how are fluids different from solids? Okay. Firstly, uh, a normal fluid, normal in quotations, a normal fluid uh, will not be able to sustain shear stresses. Okay. So if you apply a shear stress to a fluid, then uh, the fluid will deform. Okay, so uh, fluids, normal fluids, cannot are, are are not able to sustain shear stresses. Let's uh, just say a fluid So the fluid will continuously deform under shear stress. Okay, uh, so this continuous deformation means that uh, it will flow because uh, when a fluid flows, uh, its configuration changes continuously. If you take a collection of fluid particles, put it in, um, let's say, a box, and then you start applying a shear stress, and the fluid will start flowing, let's say, in a channel or a pipe, then you will see that the configuration will keep changing with time. So that's uh, known as a continuous deformation. And you know that for fluids, we use a rate of deformation uh, to, uh, to characterize the uh, flow behavior or the behavior that the fluids show as a result of applying shear stresses. Now, uh, just because a fluid is not able to sustain shear stress does not mean that it's not able to resist the deformation. Okay, so there's a difference. So uh, for example, if you have uh, honey versus water, then honey has a high viscosity, as we already know. So if you want to stir a spoon in um, a glass full of honey, you will have, have to apply more force or in a way more shear stress to create the same sort of deformation. Okay, so the fluid does uh, uh, resist the deformation but uh, it still will not be able to stay stationary. It will deform. It will not be able to sustain shear stress, but it may provide different level of uh, deformation depending on the um, rheological property or the constitutive property of the fluid.
Okay, so I'm not telling you what this constitutive property is, uh, but very soon uh, we will come to that. So uh, now that we have stated um, that a fluid is not able to sustain shear stress, so a corollary of that is that if you have a stationary fluid, a static fluid, that means that there is no shear stress acting on it. Okay, so we can conclude from the above. So a fluid at rest will not have any shear stress anywhere. So anywhere is important because uh, you have to make sure that at all points in the domain and in, in the flow fluid, and there's no shear stress. Because if there is a shear stress, then the fluid will not be able to resist that and it will continuously default. So that will, uh, the fluid will not be at rest anymore. Okay, so let's um, um, discuss, um, let's, let's talk about stationary fluids because uh, that's uh, uh, more, uh, restrictive and then we'll uh, go to more general cases where the fluids are flowing. So let's uh, talk about static fluids. All right, so let's uh, take a fluid configuration. It's an arbitrary fluid configuration that I've shown. So this is a collection of fluid particles at any time. And uh, what we do is we take a point P and we draw an arbitrary cutting plane um, around the point P, passing through point P. So that means that, uh, uh, that this cutting plane is arbitrary. You could have chosen another one and then We'd only consider this part of the body. Now, uh, for this uh, initial part of the, the, the uh, part one of the body, you have well uh, a normal n hat, which is uh, normal to the cutting plane that I have drawn, and then you have a corresponding um, traction vector, which is on this acting on this cutting plane um, that I have drawn. Now we know that uh, the traction vector need not be in the direction of n. In fact, the traction vector can be split into two parts, one along n, which is called the normal stress, and one perpendicular to n in the plane uh, of the cutting plane, that's called the shear stress. Uh, but since we already have stated that this is a fluid under um, uh, static conditions, that means that there cannot be any shear stress acting anywhere. So whatever cutting plane I draw at any point inside this fluid, configuration, the shear stress has to be zero. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, so that means that the uh, traction vector T has no component in the plane of P, uh, in, the, in the plane of cutting plane. That means that the only component T has is along N. So that means that T is some constant times your normal vector. All right, so this is, uh, um, so I'll mention as the fluid is stationary. Okay, so it cannot sustain any shear stress anywhere. That means for any cutting plane you draw at any point inside the domain or the fluid domain, the uh, shear stress has to be zero. So the stress only can be normal. So at max, your T can be K times N hat. Uh, and we also know that uh, from the Cauchy stress principle that uh, traction vector is written as um, sigma IJ NJ, and that is equal to K times N. Now we can clearly see that uh, this is uh, an eigenvalue problem. Uh, in fact, uh, K can easily be seen as the eigen um, vector, sorry, eigenvalue, and N is the eigen vector. Okay, that's sigma n equal to some k times n. So that means um, n hat 
is uh, well, let's use the word principle is a principal direction of sigma so n hat is a principal direction of r sigma we don't know what sigma is yet that is what we are trying to find uh, but all we know right now is n hat is a principal direction but our n hat was arbitrary remember uh, we took just one uh, arbitrary cutting plane any other n hat that you may have chosen even then uh, that's a principal direction because uh, even for that arbitrary other cutting plane we'll have the traction vector in the direction of the normal because the shear stress is zero Okay, since uh, there's no shear stress, then we can say that uh, uh, since there's no shear stress on um, any cutting plane, that means uh, any direction or uh, let's say all directions are principal directions. All right, so all directions are principal directions of sigma ej. And uh, we have discussed this. So the only sigma that has uh, a spherical symmetry uh, is the isotropic second order tensor. So that means that uh, you can write sigma, the sigma has, can written, will be written as k times delta ej. All right, delta ij is the only second order isotropic um, tensor and since we have mentioned that sigma has a spherical symmetry all all directions are principal directions that means that sigma is isotropic so we can write sigma as some constant times delta ij and in this case it's k because uh, um, we have we, we want to write sigma ij times nj equals to k and i okay uh, so we have uh, we have figured out what sigma looks like for static fluids. Okay, that's a very interesting uh, finding. Now, uh, we can also, uh, and um, we know from um, physical uh, uh, well, um, reasoning and understanding that fluids cannot sustain tension. So if you take a fluid in a box and you apply tension, then the fluid will, uh, well, it, it will lose its configuration. So fluids can only sustain compressive stresses. Okay. So this K has to be negative. In fact, uh, we, we don't call it K, uh, we call it minus P naught in this case. Okay. So this P naught is called the hydrostatic pressure. So we can see that our sigma is isotropic and compressive for static fluids. Again, these, uh, I mean, you already know about hydrostatic pressure from your high school uh, physics. Now, uh, if you remember, then um, you learned in uh, your uh, high school physics that if you have uh, water which is stationary then there is hydrostatic pressure which is because of the weight of the water so um, rho g h and uh, that pressure applies a force which is always normal to the object so in case uh, you have let's say a, a reservoir which has water in it and you have a point p at a depth of h then the pressure that is there at point P is uh, pressure at point P is rho gh 
as you already know and the force it applies will uh, be normal to any area so that means that if i have uh, let's say an object which has an area in this direction then the force will be in uh, will be normal to this object along the uh, along the uh, normal direction if you have another object uh, which is uh, kept at a different angle with the normal in this direction then the force will be um, in the uh, normal direction so pressure always acts normally and that is easy to find now because uh, from cauchy stress principle we know that the traction vector um, on any normal is sigma ij nj and sigma as we know uh, we have written it at minus p not times delta ij nj and when you apply the substitution property of uh, Kronecker delta what we get is minus p not n i so let's use a consistent initial notation here so what we see is that the traction vector um, has uh, is uh, minus p not times the normal so it's in the normal direction um, and it's a minus sign so that means it's compressive okay, so whatever normal you take it goes in that direction and of course the force is traction times so the uh, this is your df a small force acting on the small area in this uh, plane is nothing but your traction vector times the small surface area d gamma okay so it's, it's very important to be able to find the um, form of uh, the, the form that sigma or the stress tensor takes uh, if we can find that then we can find the forces uh, surface forces acting on the body at any surface where we have the sigma available it's it's it's, it's important to find the um, the uh, how how our sigma the stress tensor the cauchy stress tensor looks so in this case it is minus p naught times Kronecker delta ij All right, uh, and uh, we also can see that uh, since sigma ij is equal to minus p naught delta ij, so we can write p naught as minus one third of the trace of sigma, okay? uh, which is basically nothing but the uh, uh, the uh, spherical part of sigma, or well, negative of that. So that's the negative of the sigma mean, which we already have defined earlier. Okay, so mean was one third of the trace. And uh, if you're dealing with, let's say a gas, then um, you can use uh, your gas law, which helps you give uh, a relation between your pressure, density and temperature so which uh, the ideal gas law so p naught um, for example p naught times um, m equal to rho uh, r times theta okay. well uh, there's no m here sorry All right, so this was a discussion on static fluids. Now uh, let's uh, come to the main discussion of today's lecture that is um, uh, moving fluids or fluid dynamics. Okay, that's a more general situation. So when a fluid is uh, moving or flowing, then uh, the general form your sigma can take uh, is uh, minus p times delta ij plus tau ij. Okay. So in this case, what we have done is uh, we have uh, taken something called a thermodynamic pressure Is thermodynamic pressure is the pressure which um, you um, calculate using your um, thermodynamics, um, the gas law here. So uh, that's the thermod thermodynamic pressure. So what we have done is we have simply written sigma ij as a sum of two terms. So we have extracted 
uh, thermodynamic pressure out of our sigma and then whatever is left we call it as tau okay. so thermodynamic pressure is um, this pressure which helps us um, link it to density and temperature to the um, gas laws it's particular to um, gases which are incompressible so which are, which are uh, compressible the other part tau is uh, what we call the viscous stress tensor okay uh, we'll see why it is called the viscous stress tensor i'm just telling its name so it is everything that sigma has when we have removed the thermodynamic pressure or the, uh, the, the thermodynamic uh, spherical term out of it okay uh, so viscous uh, stress tensor as of now we have there's no condition on it that means that uh, it is not the derivative part of sigma as of now so derivative part is the part which has zero trace so this uh, tau ij we saw that it was zero uh, when the fluid is at rest so that's where we wrote that sigma ij is equal to minus p not delta ij now uh, tau ij Uh, the viscous uh, stress tensor is a function of motion okay uh, so uh, this uh, this this causes flow um this causes um, shearing in the flow so it is a function of motion so uh this is we just mentioned that there So now from this, uh, what we'll do is we'll simply take the trace of this equation. So uh, we'll calculate sigma i i. So we'll put j equals to i here. So what we get is sigma i i is equal to minus p times delta i i plus tau i. Okay, so remember, uh, uh, long ago uh, we discussed that uh, that's the beauty of the tensorial algebra that uh, you can um, develop special cases or relations by applying um, uh, making one index equal to the other. Right. So uh, sigma i i is equal to minus. Um, 3p because delta i i is 3 plus okay, so you can see that sigma i i uh, the terms here are all scalars because there is no free index so from this we can find our thermodynamic pressure as minus 1/3 of the trace of tau minus the trace of sigma sorry uh it's the other way around right so it's the trace of sigma minus the trace of tau all right so uh this um p and that we have uh, calculated uh, we have shown here the thermodynamic pressure this is equal to uh, p not uh, for the hydrostatic uh, uh, pressure of fluids at rest now uh we just uh, so we will mark this equation as equation number uh, we will call this one as 1 and this one we call two uh now we just mentioned that it's the viscous uh, stress uh, the um, uh, shear part that 
is a function of motion. Okay, so the motion, as we have learned, is quantified or is characterized using the rate of deformation tensor D. Okay. So uh, when you apply uh, some uh, viscous stress, then that results in the uh, flow or the uh, change in the deformation of the fluid configuration. And in the previous lecture, we talked about linear fluids. We said, uh, said that uh, so we said that for a linear fluid, your uh, tau yj can be written as k, which is a fourth order tensor, k uh, subscript ijkl times d k. Uh, we also call linear fluids as Newtonian fluids. Okay, so this K, which has a total of 81 components, uh, contains the information about the uh, rheology or the uh, constitutive properties of the fluid, which we call as the viscous properties. Okay. Now, uh, we also talked about in the previous lecture about isotropic um, uh, solids. Similarly, uh, we can also have isotropic fluids. In fact, most of the fluids we deal with are isotropic. So isotropy means that there's no directional preference or if you uh, transform the coordinate system, then your K and uh, the constitutive, um, I mean, uh, the, um, sorry, the constitutive tensor that you have, the fourth order tensor is uh, isotropic. So that means uh, it is invariant under rotation of the coordinate system. So uh, we derived an expression for uh, the form of um, the uh, constitutive tensor. And then we applied that. In fact, let's open the previous lecture's notes and quickly have a look at it. So as you can see here that uh, we derived an expression for how uh, the uh, tensor C, when we, we were talking about solids, so we use the word, we use the letter C here. So we derived an expression for uh, the form of this isotropic fourth order tensor for, with, with a particular uh, condition of the symmetry of sigma. And then we substituted that and finally we got this expression for sigma versus epsilon. So the same expression holds for fluids where sigma is replaced by tau and uh, epsilon is replaced by D because we are starting with a different expression for a linear um, fluids, which is tau ij is equal to kijkl times dkl. Okay, so we'll just copy uh, this expression and that is there at the end, um, except that we will replace sigma with tau and epsilon with d. So since uh, tau is, is this linear fluid, so tau ij is k ij kl times dkl, and uh, we apply the uh, isotropy approximation. We'll mention that most fluids So when I say most fluids, uh, this includes all gases and uh, most liquids, ex except for uh, long chain molecules. Okay. Uh, so uh, if, if you put, um, let's say, water or any fluid in a jar, then the fluid and molecules are, are moving around. So there is no um, spherical symmetry left uh, unless you have long chain molecules, which because of the um, size of the chain, etc., and then their bonds have a particular configuration they want to take, 
which uh, with, with respect to each other. So hence uh, the, um, the the fluid behaves um, non-symmetrically uh, in in terms of direction. Okay. Otherwise, most fluids are isotropic. So if you apply the isotropy approximation, then our tau takes this form. All right, so I have simply replaced uh, sigma with tau uh, in elastic solids, and uh, the epsilon has been replaced with d. And I've simply put a lambda star and mu star just to differentiate that from lambda and mu that we had in the previous uh, discussion as the Lamy constants. Okay, so this lambda star and mu star are called viscosity coefficients. So you can see that. Um, you have um, both of them. So you have uh, instead of those 81, you only have now two viscosity coefficients. So you need two um, coefficients or two properties from coming from the material constitution of your liquid. So depending on if you have water or honey or some other liquid or, or a gas, you'll, you'll need to provide two properties um, that, that are dependent on the uh, constitution of the material and these are called the viscosity coefficients all right so this is the expression for tau now i can uh, write the uh, general expression for sigma now sigma ij which we had written earlier as minus p times delta ij plus tau so i'll simply replace that expression for tau here Now what I do is I'll take a trace. So we get a trace. So you get sigma i i is minus three p plus three lambda star d k k plus two mu star d. In fact, uh, I can simply write that as dkk. Okay. There's no difference. It's simply a scalar. All right. So uh, then I will uh, divide both sides by three so that uh, this um, three is gone. And then you have a two by three here. And then I can combine uh, two terms. So this dkk is uh, can be taken as common so this is the expression we have for uh, the trace of one third the trace of sigma you will see why we are doing this uh, in just a while and this uh, term in fact let's uh, take a negative of both sides Okay, so this term, which is um, minus um, minus one by three sigma i i, is called the mechanical pressure. Okay, so we have two pressures here for uh, fluids which are flowing. One is simply p which we called, remember the thermodynamic pressure, which is what uh, we get from our, uh, for gases, we get it from the ideal gas law, PV equal to NRT or P equal to rho RT. Um, uh, and this PM, which is minus one third, the trace of sigma is called the mechanical pressure. So there's two different pressures that we have uh, written for our, um, and you can see that they're different. Um, so we can see that uh, PM is equal to P minus this um, lambda star plus two by three mu star DKK. Now uh, we'll state uh, the um, a hypothesis, a very important one, which is called the Stokes hypothesis. Okay, so as per this hypothesis, 
your mechanical pressure equals thermodynamic pressure. Um, let's, let's write explicitly thermodynamic or uh, equilibrium. Okay. So mechanical pressure is equal to the thermodynamic or equilibrium uh, pressure under the Stokes hypothesis. It's an hypothesis which was given by Stokes. Now you can, um, I mean, I will not go into details of that. It's not an advanced fluid mechanics course. So we're not going there. I simply, uh, the job simply we have here is to be able to derive a constitutive model for fluids, which can be used um, later. Uh, now this uh, hypothesis can be derived using physical arguments. In fact, uh, it can be shown using physical arguments, but what you can do is uh, you can simply state well, let's uh, mention that uh, it only is invalid for a very special uh, case of flows uh, where you have um, um, high frequency um, sound waves, for example, in a shock, uh, which is uh, this situation is called expansion damping. Okay, so it is. Uh, let's say that. True in most cases. except in expansion damping, uh, which is uh, when you have a high frequency sound waves in shock. Okay, uh, you don't need to worry about all these um, terms if you don't understand them. Uh, we simply are mentioning here that this hypothesis given by Stokes states that the mechanical pressure is equal to thermodynamic pressure, uh, which is true for most cases. So uh, if you pick a fluid uh, or a fluid flow situation in general, then in most, in most probability, it will be true that the Stokes hypothesis can be applied. Okay. Uh, so for very um, high speed, uh, high frequency sound waves flow is where you get um, the situation where this uh, hypothesis is not valid. So what is the meaning of this hypothesis being valid? So that means that um, the mechanical pressure as we wrote just a while ago was minus one third sigma i i. So we can see that if PM is equal to P, that means that um, in this equation number three, um, equation three um, gives your lambda star plus two by three mu star times dkk is zero under the uh, validity of Stokes hypothesis, under the application of Stokes hypothesis. Okay, now uh, dkk um, uh, may not be zero. I mean, um, it's, it's dependent on the flow situation. Uh, so if, uh, I mean, dkk uh, cannot be zero for all the uh, fluids, it's not a fluid property anyways. So uh, what we get is that lambda star plus two by three mu star is zero. So that's very interesting because that even restricts uh, the uh, number of fluid properties to one because we have a relation between lambda and mu now. So we can write our lambda star as minus two thirds mu star. Okay, so lambda and mu are not two independent constitutive properties or uh, viscous properties, they are actually dependent on each other under the application of, under the validity of Stokes hypothesis. So if the Stokes hypothesis is valid, then our life becomes much more easier. Okay. So after all this, uh, finally, we can write the expression for uh, tau. Well, you can write for sigma as well, it's up to you. So uh, tau ij finally is, um, Let's see what the expression was that we had written earlier. So on the top, we have written uh, lambda star delta ij dkk plus two mu star dij. Okay. So lambda star will be replaced by minus two by three mu star delta ij dkk plus two mu star dij. So I'll take uh, two times mu star common. So what we get is dij minus uh, 
वन थर्ड ऑफ डेल्टा इज ए डीके right now uh, this term that you have here dij minus 1/3 of the trace of d uh, times delta is nothing but the deviatoric part of d because remember that 1/3 of dkk delta ij is the spherical part of d so when you remove the spherical part of d from itself then all you are left with is the deviatoric part which we call in this case beta ij so that's the deviatoric part of d okay, so deviatoric part is uh, the uh, denser d minus its spherical part and you can see that a test is that the trace of this is zero deviatoric part so if you put beta i i then you have d i i minus d k k which is zero okay so uh, this is the deviatoric part of d now on the left hand side we have tau ij now is our tau uh, the deviatoric part of sigma well uh, we can check that if we put um, i equal to j uh, then we see well in fact let's go back and as soon as we applied the um, stokes hypothesis we can see that uh, our tau well, um, we had marked it as 2 yeah so if you see the equation number 2 here then um, you can see that minus 1 by 3 sigma i i which is the mechanical pressure now we stated under stokes hypothesis that's equal to p so if we replace uh, minus 1 by 3 sigma i i in equation number 2 with p then what you are left with is that tau i i is zero is so that means that tau i i uh, sorry tau i j is the deviatoric part of sigma under the after the, we have applied the stokes hypothesis so this is the deviatoric part of sigma so it's interesting because what we have done is we have said that the deviatoric part of sigma is two times a constant times the deviatoric part of d that's as simple as that i mean all this uh, that we have done for the last uh, half an hour is simply coming to this expression that the deviatoric part of sigma is twice times mu star which is the viscous uh, viscosity uh, coefficient times the deviatoric part of d that's the easiest way to remember this expression okay then you can expand this in whatever form you want all right so finally now that we have uh, a constitutive um, law available for uh, linear um, fluids linear um, viscous fluids uh, where stokes hypothesis is valid now we will apply that or we will use that in the general um, modeling equations that we have to be able to develop equations a set of equations which is closed so let's do that that's the second um, agenda for today's lecture so let's uh, study the mechanical behavior of a fluid now remember that uh, you always have to um, i mean um, you have to keep questioning as to why we are doing all this what's the aim of developing this theory the set of equations and so on so the aim was that if you have um, a stress field that's applied on a continuum body let's say fluid then you should be able to predict how the fluid will deform or how uh, well how the fluid will deform in this case uh, the rate of deformation we have to find that uh, and in general terms uh, we have to find if you have a liquid and you apply some sort of uh, force to it somehow then you have to figure out uh, how fast will it flow what is the velocity if you can find the velocity field of the fluid you have uh, you have figured out uh, you have quantified the motion in the fluid because of that stress so that's the aim we have to find how the fluid will flow 
as a result of the external forces acting on the fluid. Okay, that's what uh, mechanics is all about. So we have to have an equation, a set of equations where we can predict these, uh, the behavior of the fluid flow through the velocity field. So remember that uh, the flow equations we wrote, uh, we, we developed were, the first one was the conservation of mass equation, which was you know, rho dot plus rho times vi comma i was zero. Call this A, that's the conservation of mass. That's exactly the same form that we had developed and we derived. Now the second equation, the conservation of momentum equation was uh, sigma ij comma j plus rho bi was equal to rho bi dot. So the left hand side, the first term is uh, the surface force term, the second term is the body force term and the right, right hand side term is the uh, well, mass times acceleration, except that we have divided the mass divided the mass by volume, so we have density times acceleration. And uh, remember, we had derived this for an integral uh, volume, uh, integral over a volume. Then, but then um, we developed or we extracted the local form of the equation out of it, saying that the volume that we have chosen is arbitrary. So this is the equation that links our sigma um, and um, velocity and density. The body force is something that is given to us, but sigma is something that we have to calculate as a result of um, the external or the boundary stress field that's been applied on the body. So this sigma is the internal stresses at each and every point inside the body. Okay, so this is the conservation of momentum or the force balance equation. So you have one equation here. And you have three equations here because uh, you have one free index i here. So i can take values one, two, and three in this three dimensional world. All right. Uh, so now uh, remember we said that uh, how many unknowns do we have? So we have, uh, so we have one density, three velocities, and we have six stress components, um, uh, given that the stress is symmetric. So you have a total of 10 unknowns, but you only have four equations. So that means that you need six more equations to close this set of, uh, close the system. Okay, so this is where our constitutive model comes into the picture, which is our equation for linking sigma ij is minus p times delta ij plus this we will call as C. Now in this equation, how many equations do we have here? So we have uh, a total of um, six equations. Right, because uh, we have six independent terms in sigma. So we have a total of six equations. And do we have any unknown here? Uh, as a, I mean, uh, sigma is of course taken as an unknown. Uh, P is also an unknown. So we have one unknown as the pressure, which is not known. Uh, then we have Dij also as an unknown because Dij is not known to us. Mu is given, that's a viscous property of the fluid. So in the process, of and now D is symmetric, so it's uh, six uh, unknowns here. Well, let's write that number. So one density, three velocities, six sigmas, six D, and one pressure. So in order to close the system, we wrote an equation. We, we wrote uh, an equation which has six equations in it. But in that process, we generated seven more unknowns. That means we need seven more equations. Okay. But uh, don't worry, I mean, we will soon close this. So the other uh, relation we have is something we already know is the definition of D. Now Dij, if you remember, was the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor. So this was Vi comma J plus Vj comma I. This we call D. So here we have six equations. 
for uh, symmetric D. And uh, velocity is not an unknown because velocity, uh, velocity is an unknown, but we already have considered that above. So there is no unknown coming as a result of this equation. So we need one more equation. As we can see that we have one uh, unknown more than the number of equations, which we can easily, um, for that we can easily use the, for gases, for example, we can use the ideal gas law. So where pressure is some function of density. So here you have one equation and you have no unknown because pressure and density both have been considered. So you can see that now the number of equations and the number of unknowns are the same. So this uh, gives us um, a set of equations that we can solve and characterize the flow of a fluid. Okay, that, that's pretty much it. So uh, this uh, sort of completes the whole picture. Uh, the, the whole uh, reason we developed this uh, theory uh, has been applied to linear fluids to demonstrate the um, how, how this uh, continuum uh, mechanics theory is used to develop a set of equations which we can then solve mathematically uh, to find the, uh, to characterize the motion in uh, fluid. Or, I mean, uh, we've taken the example of a fluid, we could have also considered solid. Uh, as an example, but again, uh, this this set of equations that you have is considered the first lecture of uh, a course in advanced fluid mechanics. So whenever you go for an advanced course in fluid mechanics, your first lecture will be detailing these five um, equations or the set of equations with the list of unknowns. And then the whole course will be about how to solve this and what sort of physics you can extract uh, and, and intuition you can develop for uh, seeing the solution of different uh, scenarios for different flow situations. Okay, um, so we have reached that point where we can connect this course to uh, an advanced fluid mechanics or an advanced solid mechanics course. So, um, I mean, I, I work in fluid mechanics, so um, I thought that I'll give you a flavor of the fluid mechanics part here. As, but again, uh, we, we have done everything as a part of continuum mechanics to be able to start the next steps uh, which you may require later. Now, uh, solving these set of equations uh, is in itself a beast. So uh, these uh, set of equations are highly nonlinear and uh, solving them is, I mean, you have uh, lots of courses in mathematics and uh, um, advanced numerical methods which are used to solve these equations. So that is not what we want to do or what we want to discuss, but we can at least simplify this set of equations to a form which is um, more um, readily analyzable for uh, solving it further. Okay. In fact, what we can do is we can simply substitute equation number D into equation number C. So uh, that will um, get rid of the um, rate of deformation tensor and um, write, we will be able to write the equation number C in terms of velocities. And then we can substitute equation number C, which is an expression for sigma into equation, number, in, into equation number B. And then finally, all we have is uh, three equations, A, a modified form of B, and an equation number E. So now what we'll do is we'll do a lot of uh, uh, tensile algebra to substitute D and C into equation number B. So um, it's, it's a fun exercise to do. And in the process, we'll derive uh, an equation called the Navier-Stokes equation for fluid flows which is considered a millennium problem, um, well, a million dollar problem as well. Uh, that means that um, if you solve this problem, you will get $1 million uh, from someone. Okay, uh, so let's uh, substitute the expression for D into sigma. So we'll say substitute uh, the equation for D in C. Sigma ij was minus p times delta ij uh, dij. So I'll, I'll write the expression for dij here. Then you have minus two by three mu times delta ij.
and then we have dkk that simply means that uh, we substitute vk comma k plus v yes that's dkk that's substituting uh, i equal to j equal to k in your equation number d the expression for um, rate, rate of deformation okay so we can simplify this a bit further So this expression in the square bracket, the last one, is simply v k comma k. So that's your sigma ij, which we'll call uh, your uh, we will let's let's call it c prime, okay, because uh, equation number c was uh, for sigma. Equation number c prime again is for sigma, but in terms of the velocity field rather than rate of deformation tensor. So now we we'll substitute C prime, which is an, which is an expression for sigma, in your uh, momentum equation. That's equation number B. So equation number B was uh, sigma i j comma j plus rho b i equals rho v i dot. So we have to find sigma i j comma j. So uh, as an intermediate step. What we'll do is, we will. Sorry. We will calculate sigma i j comma j separately and then substitute that here. So let's see what sigma i j comma j is. Uh, so we will uh, take a derivative with respect to del x j on on the right hand side. So this becomes minus p comma j delta i j. The so derivative does not go on to delta because delta is a constant, so um, it becomes minus del p by del x j. That's p comma j. Plus, uh, now you have uh, a derivative of uh, well. Let's expand this second term. So you have uh, del by. Let's use the comma notation. That's much more compact. So you have mu times v i comma j, and you have a derivative of that, and then you have a mu times v j comma i, you have a derivative of that, and then you have a minus two by three delta i j, and then we have a mu times v k comma k comma j. Okay, but tensor calculus, nothing else. Then uh, we can expand. So now uh, we can apply apply the substitution property here. So this becomes minus p comma i, applying the substitution property of delta. And then uh, we can apply the product rule in the second term. So this becomes mu comma j times v i comma j plus mu times v i comma j j. Then the second term can also be expanded. So we have mu comma j plus v j comma i plus mu times sorry, yeah, there's no plus here. Uh, plus mu. I'll just write it more compactly so that we can save some space. Right, so this is the expression for sigma ij 
comma j. Uh, so let's see uh, if we can uh, simplify this a bit. Now uh, let's see the different terms here. So minus p comma i simply tells us what's the gradient of pressure. Okay, uh, that we know that it's it's responsible for uh, driving the flow. Then you have a term called mu comma j. That basically is the derivative of the viscosity of the fluid as a function of your spatial coordinates. So we can take another approximation here, which actually is is, is quite uh, true. Um, is uh, to say that let the viscosity mu be homogeneous. So if the viscosity mu is homogeneous. What that would mean is that uh, um, the viscosity will not be dependent. Sorry, um, the viscosity will not be dependent on uh, the spatial coordinates. So mu comma j will be zero. Okay, so the reason I did that at this step is because if you, if for some reason your viscosity is not uh, homogeneous, then you have to use the expanded form that I have written here and substitute that into equation number B to get, derive your uh, Navier-Stokes equation or the momentum equation. But um, taking the approximation of uh, homogeneous viscosity is quite common. It's, it's quite um, I mean, uh, true for most of the fluids. So we will do that uh, to analyze uh, the system here. So what we'll say is, so for homogeneous viscosity, mu comma j is equal to zero. So we have a simplified form for sigma ij comma j minus p comma i. And then uh, the second term becomes zero. We have mu times vi comma jj. Then all the next term again is uh, well, this one again is zero. So then we have mu j comma ij and then finally we have minus two thirds of delta ij mu times vk comma kj right so this is the expression for sigma ij comma j that we will now uh, substitute into our equation number b so let's do that. Sorry, um, there is some issue in this term here. It is the corresponding term to this one. So this is mu v j comma i j. So that's your final momentum equation. Um, it's it's uh, it's more common. I mean, we can in fact, uh, if if you see these two terms here, then um, you can see that you have v j comma i j and v k comma k j. So uh, we can combine them uh, because uh, v uh, j comma i j is the same as v j comma j i. So the uh, second order um, difference, differential is symmetric. 
um, given the function is continuous in both direction, which it is, which, which is what we have assumed. So this can be written as, uh, you can write that as dj comma ji, and now we can combine them. Just a second, I have to close the window. Storm out there. Sorry for that. We have lost the power as well. So um, you may not be able to see me very uh, clearly, but um, I think that is the job. So we have uh, these two terms, so we can combine them. So what we have is, um, in fact, in the second term, we have a delta HA. So we can remove that, applying the substitution property of delta, and this becomes I here, right? So we can now combine these. So it becomes mu minus two by three mu. So that's uh, mu by three times V K comma K I. Or we could write V J comma J I, but that's uh, the same because J is a uh, free index, uh, sorry, uh, a dummy index here. Okay, so this equation, well, typically it's written in a different form. So we have rho times vi dot is equal to minus p comma i plus rho b i plus uh, mu v i comma j j plus mu by three v k comma k i. Yeah. Okay, so this equation is called the Navier Stokes equation, which is nothing but the momentum equation in a simplified form for fluid flows. All right, so uh, the job is to solve this equation. And if you can solve this equation, you can find the velocity field for a given configuration of flow. So if the flow is happening in a pipe, the flow is happening in a river, the flow is happening around an airplane, anywhere uh, the flow is happening, you have to solve this equation, which can help you get the velocity fields. And then that can be used to calculate the forces, etc., on the uh, wings of an airplane, for example, etc. So that helps you design an airplane for uh, more aerodynamic design, which is lesser um, drag forces on the airplane because of the wind. Right? Uh, so that's uh, typically what we do to solve our system. Now, remember that this vi dot here, uh, using material derivative can be written as del vi by uh, del t plus vk vi comma k. Okay, so that's the material derivative of this um, vi dot. So you have to include that into the navier stokes equation, and that gives you a complete equation that you can solve along with the conservation of uh, mass and the pressure equation. Okay, so we will stop here today and in the next lecture we will talk about a particular situation of a free surface flow of a fluid in a river and we'll try to solve uh, uh, the equations that we have developed and I will demonstrate that you can actually solve the equations and you can get a solution for a special case and that that actually uh, is, is we will also analyze that for the physics of the flow. So that's uh, a special uh, extra thing that I'm in including in the course, so that you feel confident. Yes, you can. You, you feel confident that you can. Yes, you can solve the system, and you get something useful out of it. All right. So uh, we'll stop here. And if you have any question, please feel free to ask.